Well, it's preaching time. Amen. I'm an, I'm an emotional basket case. The older I get, the more I cry. I don't know if that's how it's supposed to work, but that's how it's working. God gets to squeeze in my heart, it just runs out my eyeballs. <clears throat> what a blessing. Well, we're part two. I preached three points this morning, and tonight we're going to preach one point. But before you get too excited, it's got four points in an introduction and five points in the message. We was looking this morning, I'm not going to recap this morning, I can't preach at all. What I preach this morning, out of Mark 4, Jesus gave the parable of the sower and the seed. And uh, he, the disciples asked him for a, a, what it meant. And here's what he said. All right, I'm just going to, I wasn't even going to say all this. But I guess I got to start somewhere. Mark chapter 4, verse 11. Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without... All these things are done in parables. And we preached this morning on them that are without. And I uh, looked at a multitude of places in the scripture refers to them that are without. And uh, I gave my outline away. Uh, we have an older couple come on Sunday mornings, drive, how far does Brother Schaefer and him drive? About an hour or more. Uh, over an hour they drive. And he's hard of hearing, and he always asks me for my outline, and I always give him my notes, and I don't have a copy of what I preach this morning. Uh, let's see if I can remember this. Them that are without God, Ephesians 2, them that are without God are them that are without a father. Right? right? It says they're without God in this world. And then we talked about Ephesians 2, them that are without Christ are without forgiveness. Right. Am I right so far? It says you are without Christ. You are without God in this world. Just the thought of that makes my heart stop beating. I could not imagine waking up in the morning without God in this world. I don't know how people do it. I don't know how they do it. And then the third point was he talked about <clears throat> them being without understanding. Them that are without understanding are them that are without focus. Everything is just as a blur, it makes no sense. I left out another point. I didn't have time to preach it this morning. I also out of Ephesians chapter number two, it says you were without Christ, having no hope. Rich, them that are without hope, them that are without a future. We've got nothing to live for. No desire to live. I didn't get a chance to preach on that. But what I want to do tonight is preach on that other point I didn't get to. Them that are without the church are them that are without a family. Yes. Now I want you to turn with me over to 1 Timothy chapter number 3. 1 Timothy chapter number 3. And after this we got the Lord's Supper. But I got to get this message off my heart. This thing has been burning for about two or three weeks. 1 Timothy chapter 3. We see the qualifications of of the bishop, of the, of, the, of the pastor, if you will, office of the bishop. 1 Timothy 3 and verse number 1, he gives all these requirements and qualifications. If any man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth the good work. Nothing wrong with wanting to be a pastor. That's, no, that's noble. Just because you want to be one don't mean you're qualified to be one. And he gives a list of qualifications in verse number two and down. You must be blameless, a husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, not, uh, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Here we go, verse seven. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without. All right, see that? So by way of introduction, them that are without the church are taken into consideration when dealing with the pastor 
of the church. The pastor of the church has to have a testimony, has to have a good report uh, among them that are without the church. It's easy for a preacher to have a good testimony or be liked or respected within the church. But when those that are outside the church recognize his character and his integrity, that's very important. The pastor, the Bible's clear, a man that doesn't have a good report without the church is not qualified. Amen. That means he's got to be the same on Monday as he is on Sunday. And he's got to act the same way down at the restaurant as he does at the church. He's got to act the same way down at the grocery store. Can he fly off the handle, lose his temper, and slap people's jaws and cuss people out and then come to church and talk about how much he loves Jesus. Them that are without are taken into consideration. Why? Because the testimony of the pastor outside of the church is very important to transfer the, 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 the integrity and the message of the church into the community. I'm amazed at how many churches they don't have, they don't have a good reputation in their community. And I'm amazed at how many times I've asked people in the community, if I was in this, church, in this town, where would I go to church? They say, well, you don't want to go over there. I think, well, I know that church. That's terrible. Them that are without, he's got to have a good report. So we see that they're without, them that are without the church are taken into consideration when dealing with the pastor of the church. But not only, well, we can preach, we can preach a whole message on every one of these points, but secondly, them that are without the church are taken into consideration when dealing with the practices of the church. Here's what Paul said to the church at Colossae in Colossians chapter 4, verse number 5. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without. So it's not just the pastor now that's being told and challenged that he's got to live the Christian life and have a good report amongst them that are without the church, but the people in the church do too. Well, it's easy to say, well, pastor's got to represent the church well. Church, uh, pastor's got to have a good testimony, got to have a good report among them that are without the church. Paul's talking to the church member. He said, all of you need to be walking in wisdom among them that are without. Everybody ought to be. And when you leave here and you go out throughout the week, you are a representative of this church. And people that don't go to this church and people that don't attend this church will judge this church by your life. Amen. That means you need to be respectful. You need to be kind. You need to pay your bills. You need to be a good employee. You need to be nice to the waitress. She didn't cook it. Amen. Well, I've, sat, I've sat with church members in, in restaurants that embarrassed me. Fussed at the waitress. She didn't cook it. Steak's not right, this and that. And then they don't leave a tip. And leave a gospel track on the table, don't leave a tip. If you're not going to tip, do me a favor, don't leave our track on the table. Please. That's an embarrassment to them that are without. Amen. Leave them a good tip, be nice to them, be kind to them, invite them to church, they might come. We can say a lot more things about that, but them that are without the church are taken into consideration when dealing with the practices of the church, or you could say the performance of the church out in the community. And then number three, them that are without the church, taking into consideration when dealing with the pressures of the church. Second Corinthians chapter number 11, the apostle Paul gives this long list of things that he had to contend with as an apostle. Second Corinthians 11, he talked about all the sufferings that he had to endure and all the things that he had to experience. And he goes into this long list, starting in verse number 23, Talked about in labors and stripes and prisons and, and, and deaths often of the Jews. Five times received I 40 stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day have I been in the deep. And journeys often in perils of waters and perils of robbers. In perils of mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen. In perils in the sea, in perils in the wilderness, in perils uh, in the city. Uh, rather, in the wilderness, in the sea, perils among false brethren, in weariness and pa painfulness, and watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Verse 23, besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, 
the care of all the churches. And I was thinking as I was reading these verses, what a blessing that all that list of things that Paul had to deal with come from outside the church, not inside the church. I know some pastors that had some of that happen with him in the church. He said, besides all that happening without the church, then I had the care and the responsibility and the load and the burdens and the pressures of dealing with the churches. What am I saying? I'm saying that there's a group of people out there today that's without the church. We're going to get to this in a second. But Paul referred to it often. And I mentioned this morning in the message, there's two groups of people, those that are within and those that are without. Right. Now the problem is we got the people that are within the church look so much like them that are without the church, can't hardly tell the difference. I remember as a little boy hearing preachers say that, Dr. Young, they say, you could take 10 people out of the world and 10 people out of the church and mix them up and line them up across the front of the church and you couldn't tell who was who. That wasn't God's plan. There's a difference between those that are within and those that are without. There's a difference in God's people. There's a difference in the children of God and the children of the devil. Amen. Apostle Paul said, I got a lot of pressure I'm dealing with. I got pressures inside the church, dealing with the cares of the church, and he addressed those in his letters and his epistles. He said, well, I got a lot of stuff happening to me from outside the church. But then thirdly, I want you to turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. Paul used that statement again, talking about them that are without. He's dealing here with a man that was committing fornication with his, with his father's wife. Dealing here with the, the, the principle of church discipline, dealing with problems in the church, or we could say it this way for alliteration's sake, them that without the church are taken into consideration when dealing with the purging of the church. Because here's what he said in verse number one, it's reported calmly there's fornication among you and such fornication is as not so much uh, a named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife and you're puffed up and have not rather mourned, but he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily is absent in body, but present in spirit have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath done so done this deed. He said, I don't need to hear the back story. Right. Well, preacher, there's a whole lot to this story. You just don't know it all. Paul said, I know enough to make a decision from way over here in whatever city I'm in when I'm writing this letter. Right. Right. I've already judged the matter. A man's committing fornication with his father's wife. That's all I need to know. Right. He said, even the lost people don't do that. The Gentiles are not even acting that way. And they were some wicked people. Corinth was a wicked city. They had a temple that was designated to sexual immorality and they had prostitutes in the, in the temple. And he said, even the Gentiles don't do this junk. Let's keep reading. He said in verse number four, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And I know I preached on this several weeks ago when I was preaching on the loads of the leader, but it's all through the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. Their sin has to be confronted. And if the church is going to be the pillar and the ground of the truth and judgment must begin at the house of God, then sin has to be addressed inside the local church. He says in verse number six, your, your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. We're going to have Lord's Supper here in a minute. We're going to use unleavened bread because leaven's a type and a picture of sin. Leaven, the, a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. You don't, have to, you don't have to have a whole lot in there to ruin it all. Brother Randy Watson, one of our men, gave us a bushel basket of donut peaches. Y'all know them donut peaches? Up in, the, up in the Pennsylvania border up there somewhere in the Maryland, there's some orchards. The donuts, little flat donuts looking peaches. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Man, you live up here. See, down south, we got the big fat peaches with a big old seed in it. These are little flat peaches. How many <clears throat> don't know what I'm talking about? Raise your hand. Oh, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> they grow them right up here. You got to go get you some of them donut. They're called donut peaches. They're flat and they're round and they got a big old, big old dimple in the top and the bottom. It's like a donut. And the seed's only about that big and it's sweet as sugar. And you got to lean over when you eat because it'll just run all down and just get all over you. He gave us a bushel basket of them. 
I shared some of them with Brother Smith and he loved them. And we went fishing and we stood up there. They fished and I stood there on the dock and ate a big old bag of peaches. I'm like, I'm good, y'all keep fishing. I was, just, I was just eating peaches. But at the bottom of it, there was a bad one. And guess what? All the ones that was touching that one got bad. That's what he's talking about. You leave sin in the church, it'll start to permeate. You won't know why, because people in the church that are not right with God gravitate toward wicked people. They don't mark them and avoid them like the Bible says. They don't separate themselves from them. They don't stop fellowshipping with them. They don't reprove them and rebuke them. They hang out with them and it starts to spread like a cancer. I'm going somewhere with this. Paul said in verse number seven, purge out therefore the old leaven. You may be a new lump as you were in leaven. For even Christ, our Passover, sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. That's pretty clear, ain't it? I mean, you don't have to have a Greek, you don't have to have a Greek concordance or a doctor's degree from a Bible college to understand that. Yet not all together with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters. For then you must needs go out of the world. Look at verse number 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that's called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner, would such an one know not to eat? Verse 12, for what have I to do to judge also them that are without? Here we go again. Without what? Without the church. Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So we see that the, them that are without the church are taken into consideration when dealing with the purging of the church. I got them backwards because I was in a hurry. The purging. And so here's what he's saying. He says, you as a church are responsible to deal with sin in the church. And then you kick them out of the church and once you do that, then I'm going to deal with them. That's what he said. You won't know why God's not judging a lot of people because the church ain't dealing with stuff. You won't know why a lot of people are not being restored, why not, a lot of people are not having an opportunity to get right with God, because their sin's not being confronted. Right. And I just preached all this a few months ago. And I don't understand why God chose in his sovereignty to appoint the man of God to be the decider of what sin and gets confronted and when. But God limits, stay with me now, God limits his judgment on that person until it's dealt with and confronted. Sure he is. Why didn't God just kill Achan when he stole all that stuff from Jericho and buried it in his tent? Why didn't God just go on ahead and kill him? God made the man of God have to deal with it. And God made the church, the people of God, pick up stones and throw the stones and stone him and his family. Why didn't God deal with David when David killed Uriah and committed adultery with Bathsheba? Why did he make Nathan have to go stick his finger in his face? David didn't repent. He didn't get restored. And judgment was an issue till he was confronted. And we could just go all day. When Saul spared Agag, why didn't God just go ahead right then and strip the kingdom from him? No, God made the man of God have to lose sleep and cry his eyeballs out and tell him your, your, your kingdom's been rent from you. When Ananias and Sapphira connived and schemed and conspired to lie against the Holy Ghost at their kitchen table, why didn't God strike them dead right there in their living room? Why did he wait for them to come to church and have Peter look at them and say, why have you done this? And them have to die in the church and disrupt the service. And people in the church have to go out and bury them. Why is Paul telling the church at Corinth, you need to deal with this man. You need to deal with him. You need to turn him over to the devil for the destruction of the flesh. God didn't do it. The church was told to do it. <laughs> and God said, when you kick him out, then I'll judge him. You judge the ones that are in the church. I judge the ones that are outside the church. 
It's all through that Bible. You say, well, I don't like the idea of church discipline. Well, the only thing I can tell you is either don't sin, live in sin, or don't join a, 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 a church that believes in church discipline. We got several people in the church now we'll have to deal with if they don't get right with God. We'll have to bring them before the church. Living in open sin. It's one thing if you suspect somebody. It's another thing when it's all over the internet. You ain't got no choice. You ain't got no choice. We'll rub it in everybody's face. Either get right with the Lord and repent. And move on in your Christian life, or we're going to take your names off the roll. Can't be a member of this church and live in open sin. Not if we're going to be a New Testament church. Is everybody okay? If you want to, if you want to run and cohort and act like them that are without, then we'll just make that possible. We'll make you one that's without. We'll take your name off the roll, and then you won't be one of them that's within. That's what the Bible's teaching. I wasn't even going to preach on this. I was just going to blow right through this. I hadn't even got to the message yet. Might not get to the message. I'm going to tell you why we can't have revival in this country because the church is acting like the world. The church ain't supposed to act like the world. We're supposed to be different from the world. We were called out. We were called out. We were separated from the world. Some of y'all are getting real nervous. I know what you're doing right now. You're trying to think, what did I put on my Facebook page? <laughs> you might not have put anything, but them heathens you was hanging out with probably tagged you in it. On, Be sure your sin will find you out. Some of y'all are clinching right now. You're clinching. Good, that's good. Fear of God ought to, ought to smite every one of us. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without. Amen. We want God's presence in this church. I want God's hand on this church. I don't want God to take his hand off this church. I'm going to see, I've seen churches all over the country. God take his hand off of them because they got a soft attitude towards sin. Is everybody okay? This is the Bible. It's called New Testament church discipline. You go to people and you say, listen, I've seen you involved in this and you, go, you need to fix this. You need to get right with the Lord. You need to quit doing that. And you need to possibly even stand up in the church and tell the church that you're sorry and give us a chance to forgive you and we need to create some accountability here. And if they don't want to do that, Take somebody else with you. Take a couple more people and you go do it. And this is Jesus told his disciples all this. Right. Amen. He said, bring them before the church. And if they don't, if they don't, kick them out. Well, that went over like a lead balloon. And none of that's in my notes. All I got is the Bible verse. Let me give you five points right quick. Them that are without, them that are without the church, what you thankful for the church? I'm thankful to God for the church. Y'all can relax now. It's going to get good from here, all right? That, all the hard part's over. We're going to pull the teeth. We're going to pull the teeth now, all right? We're going to sew it up now. I'm thankful for the church. I love church. I love all of it. I love from the prelude and the talk and the fellowship and before church, to the choir music, to the congregational songs, to the special songs, and the quartet, our young people's quartet was supposed to sing tonight, but they was gonna sing the song that she sang. And I said, well, we just killed two birds with one stone. I'll just skip the singing and go straight to the preaching. Brother Gene up here singing, no one ever cared for me like Jesus. And you don't hear that at Walmart. You don't, you don't feel and experience what we feel and experience in this place Amen. at the stadium, at the ball game. Right. Why anybody would skip church to go to a ball game is beyond me. There ain't nothing down there compares to what we got down here. And I love a ball game as much as anybody, but it don't come close to church. 
Them that are without the church have no idea what they're missing. I'm going to tell you what they're missing. They're missing being a part of a family. One of the young ladies in my Sunday school class this morning testified with tears in her, in her eyes, and here's what she said. She said, pray for me. She said, I have been for so long told not to say nothing by my family. For so long I've been told to keep my thoughts to myself, my opinions to myself, what I believe and what I care about to myself and suppress how I feel about things. I've been told that for so long. Now that I'm in church, I'm having a hard time opening up to people that believe just like I do. That's what she said in Sunday school this morning. Am I right? She said, pray for me that I can break out of this, this rut that I've been in where I've always just got to suppress it and bite my tongue and keep it to myself. And now I'm surrounded by a whole bunch of people, a new family that believes like I believe looks at the world the way I look at it, looks at God and the church the way I look at it, and I can talk about it now, and I can express my, my heart and my feelings. I said, that's what I'm talking about. Them that are without the church are without a family. Four or five things quickly. Number one, them that are without the church are without the communion of the people of the church. What a blessing. Y'all are a blessing to me. One of the biggest lies you'll ever buy into is, is before church, when the devil says to you, you don't have to go, nobody will notice. That is the devil doing what he does best, lying. I do notice. I sit up here and I look at people who's not here and I think to myself, I wonder why they're not here tonight. I wonder why they're not here. They know I didn't finish that message. I thought the first part was pretty good. Now, that's just me. I may be a little biased, but I thought that first part was pretty good this morning. Amen. Talking about how good God is to save us. And I didn't get finished, and they didn't come back to hear the rest of it. And if I was a snowflake, I'd be offended. But instead, I'm just thinking to myself, the devil told them if they didn't go tonight, would nobody notice? And he's a liar. I do notice it when you're not here. Everybody notices it when you're not here because we're a family. We sit down at our kitchen table and when one of the kids are not there, we notice it. We notice it. On Sunday, the kids are coming in late from bus ministry and we notice when they're not there. And we like it when they show up early where they can grab a plate and sit down with us before we get done eating. And when you're not here, we miss fellowshipping with you. Because see, them that are without the church are without the blessings of the communion and the fellowship that we have with one another. Are y'all getting this? I was thinking about Acts 2. Anybody in a hurry? Good. Acts 2, 41, then they gladly received his word, were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls, added unto, unto, unto them, the church. They had 3,000 people join the church in one day. They went from 120 to 3,120 in one day. In verse 42 of Acts 2, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Verse 44, and all that believed were together. I like that. They got together. Birds of a feather flocked together. Amen. Boy, I gravitate toward people who believe like I believe. I had fun with Brother Smith this past week. I enjoyed fellowshipping with him. <laughs> After church, I'd always go back there and I'd say, are you hungry? He said, I don't know, are you hungry? I said, I don't know, are you hungry? <laughs> well, what do you want to do? I said, let's go. Neither one of us was hungry. We weren't hungry for food. But we was hungry for fellowship. Yeah. Yeah. I wish I'd have had a, a, a video camera in my truck when we were together. Well, he ain't good. We wouldn't. He told his wife. He said, "Me and my chef may end up in jail. You may have to come get us out." He said, "We're not good for each other. We get each other all fired up." 
and we're going down the road and we're preaching to one another and we're sharing Bible verses and we're talking about things and he's sitting up in his seat going, and that's what I'm talking about. And that verse over there, yeah, that verse over there. And I'm telling you something else. And we're just preaching. People driving by probably thinks we're fighting with one another. <laughs> we was preaching to one another. We were fellowshipping. Enjoying being with God's people. I question somebody's salvation that rather hang out with lost people than church people. That's a good sign when people hang around at the church and fellowship. Hour after church, y'all still standing around talking. I'm like, last one out, gotta cut the lights, I gotta go. You can stay and talk as long as you want to. I love that. People that are without the church don't have that. They go sit on a bar stool somewhere. And they nurse that cup, that glass, that bottle for an hour and a half. Nobody talked to, nobody listened to them. Barkeeper standing there, cleaning glasses, doing whatever he does, acting like he cares. He don't care. He can't help you. Them that are without the church or without the communion of the people of the church. One of the biggest things missionaries struggle with on the mission field is the loneliness of not having not having a church family. Had a missionary call me. Friday, one of our missionaries in one of them cold eastern block countries over yonder. He said, Brother Schiff, I need some advice. I said, what is it? He said, I've been here in this city 11, seven years. Seven years. I've passed out probably 750,000 tracks. He said, I got one man that comes every other Sunday morning. One man. My heart broke. He may be watching right now. He watches our services. I was on the phone with him for 45 minutes. He just wanted somebody to talk to. I'm talking about them that are without the church. They don't have the communion and the fellowship of being with God's people. Number two, them that are without the church or without the comfort of the prayers of the church. Come on. Yes, sir. My goodness, what a blessing it is, Brother Roth, when we can come in here and share our prayer requests with one another. And you can write your prayer request on a little three by five card and drop it in that box or you can email it to the church and we'll print that thing out and everybody in the church is praying over your need or your concern and your burden. See, them that are without the church don't have that. They don't have that. In Acts chapter 12, Peter therefore was kept in prison, verse 5. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. He had a church family. <laughs> that when he was in a jam, they got together and prayed. And they prayed that old boy right out of jail, didn't they? Prayed him out of jail. The Bible says many of them were gathered together in verse number 12. Many, many were gathered together praying the comfort of the prayers of the church to be able to call and say, I need y'all to help me pray. I need y'all to pray for me. What a blessing. Them that are without the church don't have that. James 5, verse number 14, is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil. In the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. If any have committed sin, they shall be forgiven him. He said, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And on and on and on we go. Paul said in Philippians chapter number one and verse three and four, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you all making requests with joy. What a comfort to have the prayers of the people of God. Those that are without the church don't have that. I'm afraid those that are within the church don't utilize it like they should. You hear how quiet it is right now? I'm going to tell you why some of you can't say amen because you ain't praying for each other like you're supposed to. That's the first message Brother Smith preached on Sunday morning, intercessory prayer, praying for one another. The world don't have that. The lost don't have that. I'm thankful as a part of the church I've got that prayer of the people of God. What a comfort. Number three, them that are without the church are without the correction of the preaching of the church. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture 
It's given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished in all good works. See, those that are without the church don't have the blessing, the blessing, the, the privilege and the blessing for a man of God to stand up and open up a Bible and say, now this is what you need to do and this will fix your problem. Right. This will fix your marriage. Amen. This will fix your children. Well, I didn't even get a single amen on that one. Amen. Anybody here your kids need fixing? Amen. Marriage needs fixing. Yes. Your thought patterns need fixing. Amen. You need correcting in any way, shape, or form. You know where you get that? At the church house. Right. Through the right. preaching of the word of God, them that are without the church don't have that. They just keep living in the mess and doing the wrong thing over and over and over. They don't have anybody in their life to tell them what they need to change, what they need to fix. But those that are inside the church are blessed. God will send people through here. God will send evangelists through here or missionaries through here or God will lay the burden on a, on a pastor's heart to preach a message that will help you fix your problem. Amen. But them that are without the church don't have that. Boy, I'd hate to think of the life I'd be living right now if it wasn't for the preaching God's let me hear. Yes, sir. I'm a product. Yes, Brother Tim and I were talking this morning about a preacher that just passed away. I've known him my whole life. He's actually from down in South Georgia near where I was born, Sylvester, Georgia. Brother Marin Atkinson. Marin Atkinson used to preach every morning at Brother Sammy Allen's camp. I was a little boy listening to Brother Marin Atkinson. He had this, he had this little... He do his shoulder like that. Am I right, Brother Tim? He had this little tick he did. And if you just bumped into him at the store or you bumped into him in the aisle, you'd think, oh, this, this, this guy's got a problem. Till he got up there and opened that Bible and dove down in there so far, if you didn't bring scuba deer, excuse scuba gear, you'd drown. I mean, that he'd take you down deep, keep you down there for about an hour in those morning sessions. He just passed away. I was thinking about all the preaching I've heard in my day from people like Marin Atkinson and others that helped me fix what was wrong with me. Preaching will, preaching will fix it if you'll listen, if you'll heed it. It's amazing. A lot of people, they like good preaching, they just don't do none of it. Well, preacher, that helped me. It ain't gonna help you till you go home and take your medicine. Writing a prescription ain't never helped nobody. You gotta go get that prescription filled and take your medicine. Them that are without the church, they don't have that. Number four, is everybody still with me? <laughs> Them that are without the church or without the contribution to the propagation of the church. <laughs> what a blessing to be able to take this missionary on. And I had just told him in my office that we wasn't going to take him on. I told him straight up. I said, we're doing every nation project. We're taking on missionaries in countries we're not in. But we're glad you're here and we'll give you a love offer and let you present, let your family sing. And do y'all need somewhere to stay? No, we got somewhere to stay. Do y'all need somewhere to eat? No, we got, okay, good. Well, we're glad you're here, but we probably ain't going to take you on. But then he got to talking about going to Alaska. You got to talk about a little town up there with 1,200 people in it. Is that what you said, 1,200? And you got to talk about <coughs> surrendering to missions at youth camp I was preaching at. And I got to thinking about her, his wife, his little girl, in 2000. I'm not trying to embarrass you. In 2000, that's when we were on deputation. How old would you have been? You'd have been seven years old. When we came through and presented our work, at her daddy's church, and they took us on for support in 2000. And now 2020, 2022, she comes through here, married with four kids, and she's going to the mission field. We can't not take them on. We can't not take them on. I said, we can't not take them on. And see, though, them that are without the church don't get to get in on this. They miss out. I would get to put their missions money in the plate and then the next month read prayer letters about people who got saved in countries we can't even pronounce. <laughs> Man, I'm telling you what, to be able to be a part of something as amazing as world evangelism, 
And that woman that got saved this morning came here several weeks ago because she got an operation saturation bag on her door. Huh? Now, I'm going to ask you a question. How many bags you reckon we'd have to pass out? How many hours you reckon we'd have to spend stuffing bags for that woman's soul to be worth the trouble? Huh? And Callie's telling me about one of her little bus kids. Is she here tonight? I wouldn't want to embarrass her. Little girl on her bus. How old is she? 11 maybe. She got saved. Callie led her to the Lord just a few weeks ago. And she didn't want to go in junior church. She wanted to come in big church. <laughs> and this morning, she, her mom and daddy come walking in the back door. And she went back there to talk to them. She said, I'm glad y'all are here. I'm glad y'all are here. But I'm going to go back down the front and sit with my church family. <laughs> church family. Come on now. <laughs> the stories. The stories. Brother Berner, his wife out knocking doors. Was it Thursday or Friday? You said you went to school with that man? I hadn't seen him over 40 years out knocking doors. There's a man comes to the door. And Brother Bernard's wife got to lead him to the Lord. Amen. See, them that are without the church don't get to get in on this. Amen. But this is awesome. Amen. In a few weeks, we're going to commission Nathan and Marissa and they're going to go to the Philippines out of our church. And they're going to be preaching and teaching the Filipinos. And every one of them that gets saved, that's fruit on our account. Amen. Amen. Man, I go all night about this. Them that are without the church, they don't, they don't, they don't have no idea what I'm talking about right now. Goodness gracious. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3, 6, I've planted, Apollos wondered, but God gave the increase. He said in verse 9, we're labors together with God. We're labors together with God. Do you realize when you put your mission's money in the plate, you hook an arms with God Almighty Amen. to fulfill the great commission. Ain't that a blessing? That's a blessing. That's amazing. Number five, I'm finished. Them that are without the church are without the confidence of the power of the church. Can I remind you tonight, church, the church is invincible. Invincible. Did y'all hear about that Canadian pastor, Brother Art, Arthur? The one they harassed and arrested about three or four times, drug him down the street. You know what I'm talking about? And find him and find him and find him and harass him and torture that man. And then it went to trial and the judge said, give him all of his money back. He's right, we're wrong. So he said, he said he's right. See, we shouldn't have done that to him. And I thought to myself, I bet all them other pastors in that country <clears throat> that was all wadding up, scared, I bet they feel real dumb right about now. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you something. We live in a wicked world. We live in a wicked city. Yeah. We live in a county that find a church, this church, for having church. But the church is invincible. Amen. Don't you forget it. Amen. And I'm saying this because it's going to happen again. Right. It's, not, it's not if or when. It's just a matter of when. It's going to happen again. Right. They're going to they get it in their mind that they can shut the church down and they're going to say, y'all can't have church. And I'm going to look at them and say, watch us. Watch us. Amen. We're going to have church. Amen. We're going to have church. Because the church is invincible. Invincible. 
not because we have the First Amendment, not because we've got the Bill of Rights, but because it's the church of the living God and Jesus Christ himself said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And what a joy it is to be a part of something that the devil can't destroy. I said the devil can't destroy it. Well, he wants to. He's been trying He's been trying. There's probably some brains sitting together now, some people in suits right now, people right now with big college degrees now, sitting around the table, smoking their cigars, trying to figure out how to shut us down, but they can't do it because we're invincible. All powers given unto me in heaven and earth, he said, go ye therefore, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. What a blessing. In Acts chapter number five, now I say unto you, verse 38, refrain from these men, let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it. Lest happily you be found even to fight against God. But what's important, church, we stay on God's side. Amen. Stay next to God. Just get real close to God. Stay in the church. I said, stay in the church. I'm glad I'm part of them that are within. Amen. I'm glad I'm not them that are without the church tonight. Our hearts ought to be rejoicing. We ought to be excited. And we at the same time ought to be heartbroken for the billions of people on this planet that are without the church. And that's why we're taking on missionaries as fast as we can find them. Because there's people out there without the church. They need the church. Amen. All right, now here's what...